Genesis chapter 12. That will be our starting point tonight, Genesis in chapter 12. Amen, amen. Sam and Judy making their rounds. Yes, sir. That's wonderful. Praise the Lord. You hadn't seen some of them since Sunday. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. I hadn't either, Brother Sam. That's wonderful. Praise the Lord. All right, Genesis chapter 12, I'll begin reading in verse one. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred. Notice he said, get thee out and uh, of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Isn't that something? That's why we need to stay good friends with Israel. That right there, okay? So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken. Notice now, he said up in verse 1, Get thee out. Verse four, so Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him and Lot went with him, that's his nephew, and Abram was 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran. 75, he picks up and takes off to where God's gonna, he didn't say exactly, he said, I'm gonna gonna show you, but I'm not gonna tell you, I'm just gonna show you. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. Now, uh, there's a lot in here. I just want to take that thought of where he's, where God said to him, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. Verse four, and Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. Uh, There was no argument, there was no discussion, there was no, uh, uh, they didn't pray about it, he didn't ask his wife about it, he didn't ask none of his servants about it, he just said, here's what God has said, and since God has said this, we're gonna do what God said. Now, uh, Uh, You and I are here tonight, and I'm not Abraham, neither are you. But there's a thought here I want to talk to you tonight, help you with tonight, and here it is. And here's the message title. Times to let go and leave. Times, there are times to let go and leave. Okay? In other words, there's going to be times in our lives to where we have to uh, let go and leave. Now, there's more than what I'm going to give you, but I'm going to give you about, about five or six tonight, and I'll try not to spend a lot of time on, on these, but uh, times to let go and leave. Number one is we find over, you don't have to turn there, but I'm just going to give you the references, okay? In the book, here in the same book of Genesis in chapter 39, and in verses 12 through 15, we find the young man Joseph. He is in Potiphar's house, He has become the head of the household. In other words, he's in charge of all the servants. While he's there, no doubt Joseph is a a very young man. I know that may be a a handsome young man. And Potiphar's wife is uh, making passes at him and actually is trying to get him to go to bed with her. But we find here he's there doing his, taking care of things in the household like he should. And he finds himself alone with her. And the Bible says she actually, she actually grabbed a hold of him, trying to force him. And it says here, he, he left his garment in her hand and fled. So here's the thought. When fleeing from sin, it's time to let go and leave when fleeing from sin. You know, uh, sin is, uh, no matter which direction you look or go, There's sin, 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 sin. 
I mean, every, I mean, every aspect of sin we can think of today is all around us. And if you're not careful, you'll find yourself just like Joseph. You'll find yourself in situations and places in such and such a way that if you don't, if you don't get out of there, if you don't get away, it'll get a hold of you. Now, he could have very easily stayed with this woman. He could have very easily, no doubt, he was tempted, but uh, that temptation to get a hold of him, a matter of fact, he left his garment in her hand and fled. Now, she lied about him, told her husband that he forced himself on her and he even left his coat, so he went to prison for that. Over the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter five, it says, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Now, notice the, the uh, admonition to do what is good. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. In other words, get a hold of the good things in life. Get a hold to them, okay? Then he says, abstain from all appearance of evil. Abstain. If something even looks bad, if something gives the, uh, the appearance that it's wrong, the Bible says you abstain from that. You get away from that. You stay away from that. I'm telling you what, uh, outside the gates, of the, matter of fact, you even got to go outside the church in some places to where you'll find things going on that, that shouldn't go on. So I want to say to all of you tonight, okay, when it comes to a sin, you flee from sin. You know, if you have discernment, if you'll stay before God in prayer and stay in this Bible, you'll be able to pick out those traps of the devil. You'll be able to see things that you might, might not have seen before because the devil's looking to entrap you. He's looking to get you in a situation or in a place or in a circumstance to where you, if you're not of great faith and great conviction, you'll find yourself participating in some things you should never participate in. I remember that our class reunion, we had our 10th class reunion back 40 years ago. Okay, and uh, so it was on a Friday and, and uh, so Mrs. Baker and I decided to go and it started, I forget what time it started. So when we got there and I told her, I said, now honey, uh, we're gonna go to this thing and you know what might could happen because they didn't say, you know, if they were gonna do this or do that. And so we got there and of course we got in there, we began to meet everybody and talk and you know, classmates and we started about an hour and then they started playing the, uh, that type of music and then they opened up a, a bar and I said, it's time for us to go. And so uh, we said our goodbyes and said all this and that and, uh, and, and some of the folks were there said, where y'all going? We, we're leaving. We're not gonna stay around this drinking and stuff and all this other stuff is going on. On the way out, we passed folks smoking marijuana. On the way out, yeah. Uh, where you going? We're headed back to Walterboro. Headed back to Walterboro. And some of the folks that said, oh, you ought to stay. Uh, uh, you ain't got to participate. I said, I ain't got to be around it either. Now, the next year, they asked for recommendations, and I gave a bunch. I mean, the, the 15th anniversary act for recommendations. I said, uh, anyway, and so uh, as it would be, I, I called some of the folks that there. I said, how'd it go? They said, well, it, it got pretty wild about 9, 30, 10 o'clock. So I'm glad I left. Are you listening to me? Now, uh, having a class, it's not a sin to go to a class reunion, but it'd be awful bad if you stayed on all that stuff going on. Amen? So when fleeing from sin, you need to hit the road, hit the road. And so uh, uh, time's to let go and leave. Secondly, uh, when it comes to following the Lord, when it comes to following the Lord, now here's a good example of, of Abraham. Here he's called Abram. And uh, when it comes to following the Lord, now uh, hit the road when you see sin down the road, when you uh, temptations down the road, you flee from that. And then when it comes to following the Lord, here in Matthew chapter four, verse 20, uh, this is Peter and Andrew. It says, they left their nets and followed him. I'll make your fishes of men. There in that same chapter, verse 21 and 22, he says the same things to James and John. So uh, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Follow me. And the Bible says they left their nets and followed him. When it comes to following the Lord, learn to let go and leave and follow the Lord. 
Now, here it was. They were, these were, going, these were uh, apostles, and uh, the days of the apostles are over. He's not going to call any more apostles, okay? Apostles are those men who actually were eyewitnesses, met the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Lord Jesus appeared unto the apostle Paul. Paul did not, was not one of these 12 apostles, but he was an apostle because the Lord Jesus appeared to him, revealed himself to him, and that's why Paul called himself an apostle. There are no more apostles. So when you hear the news and read the paper, apostle so-and-so is gonna be here, he's not an apostle. Now we got apostolettes. That's women apostles, okay? There are no such things, amen. So, But when it comes to following the Lord, when God directs you, when God nudges you and speaks to you about about, uh, your life and you following him, you should never hesitate. Just let go and leave and do what God tells you to do. There's been a many a young man uh, that God has dealt with about the ministry or about, about serving him and, and even middle-aged men and older men, but because of circumstances, because of what they have or what they may, the position they may hold, they put that on hold. Never put on hold what you want to do when God says, here's what I want you to do. Never do that. Now, God's not going to call every man to be a preacher, <laughs> He's not gonna call every lady to be a preacher's wife. But I wanna say this to you, there are things that every church needs. Uh, In other words, when you got saved, when God saved your soul, he, he, uh, he saved you because he loved you, but he saved you with a purpose in mind. He saved you with a will in mind. And what you need to do is to find out what that is and follow that. And you never know, God, God wants to lead you into a, 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 a particular ministry here at this church or, or take you out somewhere else in the ministry. Don't hesitate to follow the will of God when he calls you, amen? Because when you do that, there's blessings in it. James and John didn't argue. Uh, Peter and Andrew didn't argue. Uh, and so uh, we understand that. So when it comes to fleeing for sin, hit the road. When it comes to following the Lord, don't hesitate, just do what he tells you, amen? You won't regret that. I'm so thankful uh, that I could have, I, I don't know why, but when God called uh, Miss Baker and I to the ministry, uh, we just picked up and in, in, in three months, we we're headed, headed off to Bible college and you know the story from there. Uh, that may be not, that's, that's not everybody's way, uh, but anyway, I'm glad God helped me, amen? All right, number three, when it comes to reconciliation. Now, you need to write this verse down. Matthew chapter five and verses 23 and 24. Matter of fact, let's turn there, okay? This is is so important. I I want you to read it, okay? Matthew, Matthew chapter five. Verse 23 and 24, when it comes to reconciliation, you need to let go and leave. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar and there rememberest that thy brother hath all against thee, anything against you, leave there thy gift before the altar. Notice this now, leave and go thy way First, be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. Wow. Now, when it comes to reconciliation, here's, here's, here's the thought. You need to be the one to take the first step. If there's somebody somewhere, whether it be in your personal family or where you work or in the church family, a brother in Christ, and there's an alt between you and that person, he said, if you're in the process of giving, you leave your gift there, get up, and you go, and you, you be the one to initiate the reconciliation. But the sad reality is this, that most people will never do that. Notice the terminology. Uh, you remember that thy brother hath ought against thee. 
They have all against you. Now that could be anything in the world. You go and you, you take the first step. Now, that's all you can do. You can go, you can say, hey, listen, I understand there's something between us. I don't want it to be. What can I do to make it better? Do I need to apologize? And, and, and in other words, you be the one to initiate the reconciliation. That's the best thing you can do in your marriage. That's the best thing you can do with your children. That's the best thing you can do in your church family. And he said, and first, you first be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer that gift. And so reconcile. You see, the mark, the mark of a great Christian, one of the marks of a great Christian, not just one, one of the marks of a great Christian is this, that you be the initiator of forgiveness and understanding and trying to be a peacemaker. Now, I realize there are some people that won't let you love them. There are some people so, so, so eat up with themselves and things that they will not forgive you. That they're going to go on and all, but you see, you can't do anything about that. You cannot change them, but you can work on yourself. Amen. Been a been a lot of friendships could have been could have been reconciled if just one friend would have said, "Hey, I'm sorry." What can I do to make this thing better? What can I do for us to be friends again? And they may say, nothing. Just leave me alone. Okay. So there's times to let go and leave. He said, he said leave your offering and go and do your best to get it right with that person. Oh my. Oh, the word of God, we learned that. So, It's time to let go and leave when it comes to fleeing from sin, following the Lord, and when it comes to reconciliation. And then over in John chapter four, we see another illustration of this uh, when it comes to sharing Christ, John chapter four. You You need to leave and let go when it comes to sharing the Lord Jesus Christ as a Christian. And John chapter four, we're not gonna read all these verses, but He begins in in, uh, verse five of chapter four. It says here, uh, then came he to the city of Samaria, which is called Siskar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus therefore being wearied with his journey sat thus on the well and it was about the sixth hour. About It was noontime. Verse seven, there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. give me to drink. Now I won't read all these verses. It goes all the way through verse twenty nine. But I want you to notice in verse number twenty eight, this woman. Okay, she has met the Lord. She's believed on Him. Notice what happens here. She come to get water. She brought her water pots. Verse twenty eight. The woman then left her water pot. Now watch this, and went her way unto the city. And saith to the men, come see a man which told me all things that ever I did is not this the Christ. Is not this the Messiah? Is not this the one we've been looking for? So when it comes to sharing Christ, there's a time just to leave and let go. You know, I often wonder about us Christians, us, we Christians, what, how often do you share the Lord Jesus Christ? Huh? Have you shared him anybody, with anybody today? Have you given anybody a gospel track in the last week or two? Have you called anybody on the phone and talked to them? Have you prayed for anybody? Just, just what steps have you taken to share the Lord Jesus Christ? That's a question we... If we had to stand up and answer, we'd be embarrassed, okay? Verse 29, she said, come see a man which told me all things that ever I did is not this the Christ. We ought to every day of our life, we ought to every day of our life, we ought to, we ought to let go and leave ourselves, I mean, I use the word, in other words, get out of ourselves and be a better witness. Get outside of our own little area and see people for who they really are. Who are people? 
they're just people. But they're not just, they're, they're people who are gonna die one day. There are people you may know their name or not know their name. They may be total strangers you stand in line with or there may be somebody lives down the road from you. But they're people. And don't be ashamed. Speak up. And so when it comes to sharing Christ, just let go and leave your little area and go do it. Go next door and talk to your neighbor about the Lord. You say, well, preacher, I've done that. How many times? Huh? How often? You see, the, another mark of a, of, a, of a great Christian is the fact is they're not ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't mind. In other words, they're, they're willing to run the risk of being embarrassed by witnessing. And by the way, that embarrassment will not bother you once you do it enough. Once you, in other words, once sharing Christ becomes real to you, it won't matter. This woman here, been married five times, was living with a man. Now, if a woman's been married five times, you know she's got kids. <laughs> you know she had a bad reputation, right? You know she's the talk of the town. There she goes. Huh? Matter of fact, the disciples were going to town to get some stuff and no doubt they passed this woman on the way. I can imagine the disciples as they saw this woman approaching got on the other side of the road, okay? And didn't even look her way. And yet when she got to Jacob's well, the Lord was there and he struck up a conversation with her. Of course, he was there, he was there for a reason to see her get saved. And when this woman, when she, he said, this water you're gonna draw, you'll thirst again. But if you drink of the water I give, you'll never thirst again. And she said, Lord, uh, uh, give me that water. And that day, that woman believed on the Lord. And she went back to town and said, hey, let me tell you about a man who told me all about myself. Is not this the Christ? She wasn't a bit ashamed. Now, I doubt those that they, they fully believed her, but fact is, she wasn't ashamed. So sometimes we need to get up and get out of our house, get out of our living room, leave our house, leave our little domain and go out there in highways and bad ways and tell folks about the Lord. And then we find another illustration found in the book of Hebrews chapter six. Hebrews chapter six. Times to let go and leave. Hebrews chapter six, verse one. It says here, therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Now notice what he says. The word leaving, let us go on unto what? Perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Now what, what the uh, writer of Hebrews is saying here is this. He's saying that you, you can't just live on your salvation experience. So when it comes to Christian maturity, when it comes to Christian growth, you gotta let go and leave. So that's what he's saying here. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection. That word perfection means maturity. So when it comes to Christian maturity, you gotta learn to let go and leave. You cannot, you cannot live and, and grow just on your salvation experience. You'll be surprised at people who have been saved for years and years and years and years and years know nothing about the Bible. I mean, nothing. If they had to win somebody to Christ, they wouldn't know how to do it. They'd say, I'm gonna let you call my preacher. He can tell you how to be saved. What do you know about the word of God? And Paul talks about this in the, uh, to the church at Corinth when he says, you're babes in Christ. You're still on milk when you should be on meat. So when it comes to Christian maturity, you're gonna have to get past just being saved. Oh, to learn the truths of the Bible, to be able to sit down and open up the word of God and say, boy, I'm glad I know what this means. To understand what it means to be saved eternally to understand uh, some of the, the doctrines of the Bible. Do you know any Bible doctrine? If somebody talked to you about speaking in tongues, what would you tell them? Hmm? Huh? 
If someone said, you know, I don't believe you're saved eternally, what would you tell them? If somebody said, I don't believe the Bible's the word of God, what would you tell them? So you need to understand that uh, when it comes to Christ, uh, Christian maturity, you're gonna have to let go and leave, once again, leave your little surroundings and get past just being saved. Grow up, be mature. So when the preacher gets up and preaches on some something, you say, boy, I, I'm, I'm, glad I, I, I'm glad I know that. Wow. You know, when I first got saved, I knew, I knew a few little things. And, and, uh, and I find myself doing it now. Not as much because I've grown some. But I'd go to church and I'd have my Bible. And I'd have my little notepad. And of course, Miss Baker took shorthand in high school so she'd take notes faster than I could. She'd write down everything. Get home, she'd tell me what it was. I just wanted to soak everything in. Just soak it all in. Learn. And, and I wanted to grow. I went to Sunday school and I even, we, we got, we got our, our, our quarterly books like you get. And in there it said, it, it tell you, as you went through your lesson and read such and such, read such and such. And so I'd read those other, other references of the lesson. And so when the Sunday school class would get started and, and the teacher start teaching, the teacher would say, anybody got any questions? I'd raise my hand. What is it, Brother Baker? I'd say, well, I don't quite understand this. Well, you know what that did? That made that teacher start studying. <laughs> now, I didn't ask questions outside the Sunday school class. I never asked a question that didn't pertain to the Sunday school lesson itself. But I'm glad I had a teacher, a teacher that was teaching me that could basically tell me what I need to know. And here's what I liked about my teacher, my Sunday school teacher. If he couldn't answer it, he said, preach, he said Brother Baker, he said, I'm gonna look at that and I'll, I'll get back with you on that. And he would. So if, if you gotta get past just being saved. Your testimony's gotta be more than saying, I thank God that I'm saved. It's gotta, get, it's gotta be more than that. That's important, that's vital. And don't get over that. But there's more to it than just being saved. It's Christian maturity. Amen, you gotta grow. And then, uh, matter of fact, in verse nine, look at, look at verse nine, uh, that same chapter. But beloved, look, listen to what he said. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. So things that accompany salvation. We have, we have persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation. In other words, we know, we know there's some things that you need to learn that accompany salvation. When somebody would say, you know, we have a, we have a perfect position in Christ. Do you know what that means? What is your position in Christ? You know we have several positions in Christ. Now, if I were to give you one, you could maybe tell me the rest of them. Well, Brother Baker, what position are you talking about? Well, we have, all right, for example, positions we have in Christ. All right, I have the position as a child of God, amen? All right. Uh, anybody want to give me another one? Priest. Priest. I, are, are, we, are, we, are we in his army? What does that make us? Soldier. Come on now. Is he the shepherd? What, that, what does that make us? Sheep. <laughs> Child. All right. I, I, what else? Right? He's a groom with a, see, those are positions. The body. He's the body. We're... We're members. So when somebody says, well, we have a, we, our, our position, and here's the thing about it. Our position is sealed. It will never change. You'll always be his child. Amen? That'll never change. Now the day will come as long as you hear you that. When you get to heaven, you won't need to be in the army anymore. We'll all be there. And so we understand, and so these are things, that's why you need to come to Sunday school. You need to listen when, when preachers come and missionaries come. The Great Commission 
You could ask some folks, what is the Great Commission? They'd say, well, I don't know. What is that? Is that the Constitution? <laughs> so when it comes to Christian maturity, oh my, you got to learn to let go and leave. Then last of all, in uh, uh, Luke chapter 5, go back there. Luke chapter 5, verse 28. Luke 5, 28. Hmm. I don't think that's it. Yeah, there you go. Boom. Anybody there yet? Okay, I got it now. My eyes is pouring water. <laughs> Chapter 5, verse 28. Well, let's look in verse 27. And after these things, he went forth and saw a publican named Levi. Who is Levi? Anybody want to tell me? That's Matthew. That's Christian maturity. Sitting at the receipt of custom, and he saith unto him, Jesus said unto him, Matthew, or Levi, what? Follow me. Now watch this. And he left all, rose up, and followed him. Now, this pertains to consecration, being consecrated. When it comes to being consecrated, you gotta, you gotta listen to the Lord Jesus. Now, what does that mean when I use the word consecrated? It means, of course, I've taught you this for years, it means set apart. Jesus comes to Matthew. He's a tax collector. His name is Levi. He said, follow me. He closed the book and followed him. He became an apostle. The apostle Matthew just followed him. In other words, God, Jesus told Matthew, Matthew, I want you to follow me. He, will, he wants to consecrate Matthew. He wants to take Matthew out of the tax business and set him aside to be an apostle. Now, that's what it means to be consecrated. That means you come to a point in your life where you say to the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, uh, uh, this is what, when, when Paul got saved on the Damascus Road, he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And Jesus told him, what, here's what I want you to do. And the Lord Jesus set Paul aside. Saul of Tarsus became Paul. He said he consecrated him. Now, everybody who gets saved, everybody who gets saved, God wants to consecrate them. He wants you to be a consecrated Christian. He wants you to be such a such a, a, a Christian that he can say, I want to put you right here. This is your purpose. Growing up, my grandmother. Even though they didn't have a lot of money, they were not dirt poor, but they were poor, okay? My grandmother, uh, I'll give you an example. How many of you ladies have china in your house? Real china. And some of you got paper plates too, had not you? Okay, now watch this. Paper plates, get the paper plates out. We can eat and throw them in the garbage. You don't throw the china away. Now, not every Sunday... But this past Sunday was Mother's Day. Miss Baker got the china out. You know what china sits? It sits in a little china cabinet. It's consecrated. <laughs> you just pull it out for special occasions. Amen? It's consecrated. So God wants to, has a place for you. Just for you. Be like me having a glass here, a, a a, a, a clear glass, and I would just say to the fellows, get water. And listen, I want this glass right here. Instead of using a white cup, I, want, I got a clear glass, and I want my water in this glass for each service. This is a regular glass, but it's my pulpit glass. There are preachers who have a pulpit glass. That's a con that's a consecrated glass. I mean, we got consecrated cups. Am I getting a point? Everybody who is saved, God wants to, got a special place, consecrated. Now, when you're consecrated, when you become consecrated, that will develop your separation. Separation does not produce consecration. There are a lot of people who are separated who are not consecrated. 
A lot of people who don't do the things of the world, but they don't do anything for God either. But the Christian who is consecrated, who says, Lord, what would I have me to do? How would you have me, what, what do you want me to do in my life? And God says, here's what I want you to do and here's where I want to place you. That person will be sentenced to the Holy Spirit. They'll understand the word of God and their separation will come because of their consecration. And so when it comes to that, you have to, you have to just pick up and say, well, you know, this is where God wants to put me. This is where God wants to place me. So God has a place. He wants you to live a consecrated life. That means you're set apart to serve him. You're set apart. Uh, uh, Jesus is the master, right? We call him Lord, right? And so one of our positions, we're a child of God, we are in his army. But another position we have as a, as a, uh, as a, child, uh, as a Christian is that of servant, Right? He's our Lord and what? Master. So a master, a Lord, if he's Lord, if, he, if we say he is our Lord, that means that we have no will. <laughs> that means the Lord can put her, us anywhere he wants to put us. I mean, we're raised up with what they call whatnots. My grandmother had those. Put them on the mantelpiece, you know. She'd collect them and all that. And she said, don't mess with my whatnots. I don't know why they call them whatnots, but that's what it was called. And they were set apart. They were there. You see, God wants to place you. He wants, you're his vessel. He's your master. He's your Lord. And if he is that to you, he wants, to, he wants you to be a consecrated unto him. That means you live for him and him alone. And to do that, you have to be willing to, to get up and leave. Leave, your own, uh, leave what, how you want to live. And here's the thing. Here's the thing about this. It's, I know this may sound complicated, but there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a blessing to it, okay? What's the benefits of this? What are the benefits of letting go and leaving? Well, let me give you three right quick. We'll be out here. First of all, special favor with God. When you, when, you, when you look at these things and, you're, and, and you're, you've allowed God to in your life to rule you, there's a special favor with God. Now, a person who is saved is saved. God loves every one of his children the same. I don't care how they live, what they do. They may backslide, go the way. The, the son who left the father and the prodigal son, the father still loved that prodigal. Amen? Didn't it? it did not affect his love at all. But you know what? That father could not show him favor while he was in the country. But when that boy got right with God and came home, the father showed him favor. Amen? Matter of fact, he told the older son, he said, you've been with me always. All I have is yours. So the father, hey, if you want God's special favor, you get involved in what I just told you. There's special favor. You can have two children, three children, but I'm telling you what, and you love all your children the same, but the children that are obedient, children that, 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 that respond to you as a parent, you'll show them more favor. And you should. There's nothing wrong with that. You don't show the same favor to a rebellious, rotten kid who won't do anything, for, who always stays in trouble. You don't treat them the same way you treat the one who's obedient. You still love them. So it's favor. You want God's favor? You learn this. Let me give you another one right quick. So your favor. Number two, you live more holy. When you do these things, when you're willing to, to do what God says, you will live more holy. And when I use the word more holy, that means is you're not gonna be a, have a more holier than thou attitude. You know, I'm, I got this. No, that's not it. In other words, when you live more holy, that means you'll be humble. You'll be grateful. You'll be thankful. You'll be meek. You'll show kindness. Holiness is more than just not doing things. It is doing a lot. You'll be more holy. You'll live holy unto the Lord. Amen? And then thirdly, listen, you become a better witness. You become, in other words, it'll come natural to you. You won't have to force yourself to do it. You won't have to say, well, I gotta get up the courage. It will come more natural. You'll just talk to people. You'll say, you go to church anywhere? No, oh, you ought to come visit us. We... 
I mean, you, you, you witness, your witness will be bolder. It'll be a lot easier when you do these things. But if you stay in your own little world, never venture out of your little domain, you'll never grow. You, hey, know, knowing a lot in your head is one thing. But performing what you know as a Christian is another. There's a lot of people can tell you a lot about the Bible. Can quote scripture, talk doctrine to you, but do nothing for God. I'll give you a closing illustration. First church I pastored, oh, when I went there, some of the members said, would you go visit so-and-so? I said, well, who is this guy? And he was an older gentleman. They said, oh, Brother Baker, he is a tremendous Bible scholar. He's a great Sunday school teacher. He knows the Bible. So here I go. I'm, I'm 22 years old. This guy's in his 60s. I know his name. I go see him. He's got folks in the church. He's taught Sunday school, but he's not going to church anywhere. So I said to the folks, I said, well, why don't he come to church? Oh, has a big thing happened some years ago. And he, got, he left the church mad. I said, well, if he's that good a Christian, why'd he leave church mad? I was just young, immature. I just asked good questions. So I go see the guy. I get there and he doesn't know me. I said, I introduced myself. I said, I'm the new pastor over at the church. He said, uh, off young, ain't you? I said, yes, sir, I'm still learning. I got a lot to learn. I said, but uh, folks told me about you. I want to come and invite you out to church. And uh, uh, I said, you going to church anywhere? I don't know me wrong, but just talk to him. He said, nah, nah, I'm not going to church. I said, well, I want to invite you back. We'd love to have you. He said, well, you've been here. He was very cold to me, very cold. Now, is that the mark of a good Christian? But the member said he knows the Bible. He taught Sunday school for years. He's a great teacher. But I'm telling you, he's a sorry Christian that day. He worked, hey, I wouldn't, I thought, but this guy's a good Christian. I don't want to, what is it? But now I go back and see him again. I go back and see him again. I go back and see him again. Finally, out of my persistence, I said, folks have told me all about your teaching. I said, but you know, I've been here all these times and not one time have you said anything good about the church. It's always been bad. And that's a good church. He said, how do you know that? I said, because they care about you. They care about you. And I care about you. I said, but I'm gonna tell you what, I'm through with this here. You need to grow up and walk off. Here's a man, 60-something years old. I'm 22, and I said, you need to grow up. Son, you talk about getting mad. I'm telling you what, I got word. Don't you ever send that preacher back right here again. He told me to grow up. <laughs> now, here's the clincher. His wife, when he told his wife what I said, his wife, unbeknown to him, his wife said, and that preacher's right. You need to grow up. His own wife told him, I found this out later. I said, thank God, I want to hug her neck. And he started coming to church again. Got back in church. He wasn't in the church but just maybe four or five months. And somebody said, uh, when are you going to let him teach Sunday school again? I said, oh, probably a couple of years. Probably a couple of years. And when I left there three or four years later, he was teaching Sunday school class. Had a good spirit about him. Hey, Amen. So a lot of folks can know the Bible, but knowing the Bible and living the Bible is worlds apart. Hey, you got to pick up and leave. All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, oh, we thank you for leaving heaven and coming to us to save us and redeem us and, and change our lives. And, and Lord, use us for your honor and your glory. So Lord, I pray tonight's Bible study, tonight's message here, God, would encourage us, Lord, to uh, not just be willing to sit around and just think about things, but Lord, to be busy, to put our lives in your hands and do what Abraham did, dear God, and these others did, uh, obeying your call upon our lives. Lord, help us to be consecrated unto you. In thy name I pray, amen and amen. Let's stand to our feet. God speaks to you, come and pray.
pick up. Go next door. Be willing to get out of your comfort zone. Live for God. Consecrated unto the Lord. That means God's got his hand on you. You're saying, God, you place me. You put me where you want me. I'll be satisfied. example of this and we're going to go. Y'all remember Jim and Patty Drain? Remember them? They were in the, they were in the Marine Corps, lived down in, in, in uh, Buford and they visited here one, heard the radio broadcast, came up here and visited and, and liked the church and, and then I gave him the name of some churches down there and I said, you know, brother, it's an hour drive up here and these are some good churches. If you visit them that maybe God can use you there. And so time went by and he came back up here and and I said, how'd it go? They said, well, preacher, there wasn't no, the church you sent us, they were good churches and good preachers, and that's fine, but this is where God wants us. It's an hour's drive, we understand that, but this is where God wants us. They were here until he got shipped out to Hawaii. <laughs> Ain't that a hoot? Going to Hawaii. <laughs> they said, they said when they, I think, no, was it Hawaii or something? I might have been Japan. But ended up in Hawaii, and brother, uh, Jim notified me in bank and said, you, you, y'all need to come see us in Hawaii. He sure said, well, that'd be, uh, let's go on a mission trip. <laughs> Amen. But you, you do what God tells you to do. Amen. All right, you're dismissed. God bless you. Be careful going home. Be sweet to each other. Amen. <laughs>